But I wanted to read from Acts 1-8 to get started. He said, Jesus told them, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning and that it's so clear that your presence is here with us. And I ask you to pour out your spirit on us this morning. Lord, as I speak, that, that your presence will, that your spirit will fall, that you will fill us up. Lord, that people will be set free and that we will have power to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so the main thing God's been impressing on me as a leader and a pastor lately is that we really need his Holy Spirit, and we need to be filled with his Spirit, because what's in front of us, it's impossible without him, and without his presence in our lives. You know, Living Way, we, we, every October we have a missions month, and we, we just finished that up, and it was a record uh, raising, fundraising month, which was amazing too. But each of the speakers we had come in, you know, as I listened to them and heard their heart and what they were saying and what God was communicating through them, it was setting us up. It was kind of about a posture of our hearts towards God. It was about needing His Spirit. You know, it was about joining Him in His mission and having His heart, but needing His power to do that. And that was kind of the theme of the whole month as these unrelated different speakers came in with no real plan, you know, of what they were going to talk about. And as I heard everything, you know, we've been called to in reaching the nations and reaching our city, it's just so clear. There's no way that's going to happen if we don't get, what the thing moves, if we don't get filled with the Spirit, if we're not filled with the Spirit every day, and if we don't ask for more, we need to be filled. We need a move of the Spirit that fills us with power to be His witnesses, if you hear what He's saying there. We don't have that power if He doesn't fill us with His power. So just before this, Jesus had told them to wait, right? Think about that word that was just given, wait. Wait until you've been baptized with the Spirit. He did not tell them everything that was going to unfold in history. That's what they wanted to know, right? Isn't that what we kind of want to know too? Tell us what's going to happen with our nation. That's basically what they're asking. Is this the time our nation's going to be restored? We're going to get rid of Rome? You know, that's not it. He kind of just ignores that whole question altogether. Just, he, doesn't even, he doesn't bother answering it. That's not for them to know, is what he says. But he has this tremendous mission for them, and that's our mission too, which is to take the gospel to the nations. It's to take the good news of Jesus to the nations and to be his witnesses. And what's going to make them effective witnesses is the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. And that's, that's what's on my heart, is we, we need to be reminded of that, the simplicity of the message that Jesus gave us and of the power he's given us to reach the nations. Which includes, I'm, whenever I say that, I include the city we're in too, right? We're, we're a nation that needs to be reached with the gospel again. But the problem is, you know, we often look at all of this completely backwards, I think, in the church. We hear Jesus give the Great Commission, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. And then what do we do? We jump to administration lots of times, right? <laughs> and, and we kind of look at what we've got in front of us, and we start figuring out a plan. And we, we jump right past that need to be filled with power. And we start to, to get strategies and systems and plans in place and start maneuvering and, you know, start thinking like, okay, if we can plant this many churches and train this many leaders, and send this many people out, that'll require this much money. And if we can do that then we'll be doing it, right? We'll, we'll get the mission done. And then I think that leads next, probably because we're Americans, you know, we kind of have this bigger is better mindset, efficiency mindset. That kind of moves next to thinking, oh, I need to get my church really big. Because can't big churches do that better? Because they have more money and more of those resources. You know, that kinda, that's kind of a logical th flow of thought, right? <laughs> for a, for an, in a humanly speaking. Like, okay, if we can grow big, then, then we can do the mission. But first, we have to get to a certain size. So then that becomes the focus, right? We kind of move from what, it, what Jesus was really communicating to something that's a little different. 
So I think it's good just to stop and say, what did Jesus say and to whom did he say it here? He didn't give them number goals or metrics to meet. He didn't say to, to wait till his strategic plan had been revealed from heaven. You know, they could start following it. And he didn't give this commission. He didn't give it to a big crowd or a large church gathering, right? He just told 11 guys. It was only 11, not even 12 at this point. He just told 11 guys to go and make disciples of all nations. 11 people. I mean, what, what would you have thought if you were in that little group? You know, kind of start looking around. <laughs> okay. How are we going to do that? Us? You know, that's what I'd be thinking. You want us to go make disciples of all nations? You know, imagine kind of showing up to your um, small group. You call them hope communities, I think. Showing up to your hope community. It probably has 15 total members or something, but only about 10 normally show up each week. And, you know, that's kind of the way it goes. And then the small group leader says, all right, you guys, you're going to change the world. This little group. You know, what would be your response? What, what are you thinking right now? What's your response? If I said that. What's that? <laughs> think I'm crazy? Or think, yeah. So immediately we downplay, I think we downplay the possibility of what God can do. Because we start looking at our own strength, our own skill set, our own resources, you know, our gift mix, whatever it might be. And we start to kind of think, no way. You know, that can, that's, not, that, that's just not going to happen. Not with this little group. We can't do that. So we start to approach spiritual work from a worldly point of view. And that's a big mistake. You know, God has spiritual work for us, and he gives us spiritual power for that work. And, and it's a mistake when we come in with this kind of business worldly mindset and start trying to make the mission of God happen without the Spirit. And you can, you can grow really big churches without, you know, following the Spirit with certain techniques. You, you know, you can make it happen in a sense. But that doesn't mean it's spiritual work. It could be something different. So if there's something we learn from Pentecost, y'all have already gotten that far, right? Yeah, you're in 6, Acts 6. So if there's something you can learn, it's about it, that 100 people filled with the Holy Spirit can change the world, right? There's... Think about that. That's all it was. So this room looks like it's probably about 100 people. You know, you can change the world if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You really can because we have proof from Scripture that that is possible. You don't need to be any bigger. You don't, I mean, it's not as great to grow, especially from salvations, right, that we see new people coming into the kingdom. We're not, yeah, we, we want to see that happen. But what I'm trying to encourage you to is don't think that needs to happen before you have the possibility of changing the world. What you need is God. God doesn't need a lot of people to change the world. Jesus was constantly thinning out those crowds, right? Let's get this back down. <laughs> too, many, too many people with me. So living hope can change the world. But it's not going to happen by us just getting better at practical administration. You know, it's going to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then what's going to be happening is the administrators are going to be scrambling to keep up with what's going on. So I think Susan already left, so she's not... Don't tell her. No, that's a, she's a, The administrator should be kind of frustrated when God's moving, right? Because you're constantly trying to figure out what's happening and what are we doing. That's what, that's what we want to see. What's God doing? And how are, we, how are we going to kind of manage the work that we see God doing? And that's where administrators are, are amazing, because that is a spiritual gift. But we have to make sure we put the first things first. And Ben said we have very different gift mix. I am pretty naturally administrative. Um, and so I have to remind myself of this, too, because I can quickly go into spreadsheets and beautiful spreadsheets, right? Where you, can, where you can make everything work out just the way you want. But that's not how we're supposed to, to move. We're supposed to move with the Spirit, filled with the power of the Spirit. So, you know, we, we receive the Spirit for witness. You hear that in Acts 1.8? There's a lot more the Spirit does, but this, this, there's one of the main roles of the Holy Spirit is to give us power to be witnesses for Jesus. You know, 
Oftentimes, power is displayed by the Spirit and miracles, prophecy, all those things when we're reaching the lost. You know, it's showing God's power. It's demonstrating His power. So we have to go from being intimidated, self-contained, passive, and comfort-seeking people. But that's that's where we kind of go by default. We're really comfortable in this nation. We're really, really comfortable. We have pretty much everything we could possibly need and way more. You know. Way more than pretty much any civilization has had in history, really. If you want a big picture perspective, we have, each of us has more than most kings had for most of history, just in our homes. So how do we get out of that mindset where we're just comfortable, we're just going to go home. We're not going to be actively engaged in the church to being bold witnesses for Jesus who are just willing to risk it all, right? That's what happens when we're filled with the Spirit. We become bold enough to the point where we'll die, where we'll die for our enemies because we're so in love with Jesus that we want to identify with him, right? We want to be his witnesses, we want to reach the people he wanted to reach, which was us, who were his enemies. You know, how do you go from being a, a medium-sized local church in the triad to being a medium-sized local church in the triad that is also bold witnesses for Christ and filled with the Spirit, right? How do we do that? It's just not going to happen through your own strength. So I, I want to make that really clear right now, as before we go any further. This isn't me trying to tell you to do better, um, you know. Pick yourself up, try harder, be more engaged, do it all with your own strength. It's not going to happen. I mean, who's, who's ever made those resolutions like, I'm going to witness to 10 people every week? You know, does that ever work for anybody? I mean, nothing like that's ever worked for me. It's like, you can do it for a few days maybe, and like, but it always fades because it's all about you. And I don't want it to happen that way, it's the more I thought about this, because then we would take the credit. They look at me, right? Look what I came up with in this strategy, and you can do it too. Just buy my book. And uh, you can, you know, that's not what we want. We want to be filled with the Spirit. That's, that's the only way it's going to happen. That's the only way we're going to receive the power to be His witnesses in a way that, that changes the world, that changes generations, that changes families. And at the end, I, I want to take time to pray for anybody that wants to come up and pray about this. So I'll, I'll say more about that at the end too. So we have been entrusted with the most powerful message in the world, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we carry the good news that, that dead people can be raised to life. We can be saved from our sins, given new life in Christ. And I, I, wanna, I think this is a time God's awakening us to that message too. And I want to remind you of all that he came to set us free from. Because this, has, this goes along with understanding the power that he, he's going to move in during our time. And, I, and we're already seeing some of this. You know, we're not supposed to live defeated, powerless, and bound up lives. That's not the life that a Christian is intended to live. So if that's where you are today, get prayer. Because that's not where God would have you. You know, he, he's given us his power to set the prisoner free. We're not supposed to live in that year after year, day after day. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You who were dead. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing triumphing over them in him. So he came to do two big things we see here, right? One, remember the cross. He paid for your sin. He came to reconcile us to God. He came to, to pay the penalty for our sin, to pay the debt we owed. He canceled it. He canceled that debt completely. He nailed it to the cross. It's over. So if you've already put your faith in Christ, that debt's gone. That's part of the freedom we live in. We don't live under that debt. We don't live under the shame anymore, under the condemnation of our sin. We're supposed to move forward from that, right? So we move on from that. 
And this is like going to the bank and you owe some totally unpayable debt. We know that from Jesus' parables, right? You can't ever pay this. And you're just given the forgiven stamp. You know, you're, this is totally paid for. You're free. Go on with your life. And so it's the same for us. That's where we are. And one thing I'm seeing, I, I, I think, is a sign of revival that I'm seeing at Living Way is people are calling up just to confess sin. I've never had that happen in the last eight years I've been on staff where just random, there's just random calls. Hey, I want to talk about something. And it's actually from years ago, but I've never told anybody. But I feel like God wants me to get it into the light. That's a move of the Holy Spirit. And I'm seeing people set free because this is happening. And so I think that grace is here now, that God is giving that grace. If that's you today, confess. Bring it into the light. That's where freedom is. That's, part of, that's kind of the path out, I would say, of guilt and shame. You know, you have to bring this stuff into the light, even if it's old. You know, if there's something 10 years old you've never told anybody, even if you're not still living in that, get it out there. It has an effect on your soul. And it, it has this in the background, you know, holding you back. There's a second big thing here that we read about. You know, it says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So he's disarmed the darkness, the spiritual powers, right? That's what this is talking about. All these powers of darkness, the demonic, Satan, he's disarmed it. So that's the second big thing he's come to set us free from here. It's our sin, and then it's also these powers of darkness that rule over our lives. And I, I also see God moving this way. You know, anxiety, darkness, demonic powers, you know, these things that just kind of put a cloud over your life. God wants to set you free from that, too. That's part of this revival that's coming. This generation is just under a cloud of darkness. It's, it's so much anxiety. There's so much depression. So much loneliness. Just isolation that's happening around us. And God wants to set us free. The demons are kind of having a heyday right now, I, I believe, from, from what I'm seeing. And they don't even know what the power is because like C.S. Lewis sort of prophesied in one of his books, it's like this goal is if we can make people believe that the spiritual world is not real, but yet somehow still make them spiritual. You know, we see that happening now, right? It's like they've denied God, but they're still spiritual people somehow. I don't know. But, but so they're really just under the power of darkness, but also caught up totally in materialism to where they're not even aware of the darkness. And there's just so much of that happening. And we need to be aware of this when we're ministering to people. Not everything is, needs medicine. Some things do, but not everything. We need to learn spiritual discernment. What's demonic? What's physical? What's emotional? You know, what, what are we dealing with here? What needs, what needs to be confessed? Another aspect of this is that because the church has, uh, more and more people are growing up outside of the church and they don't know the word of God, biblically illiterate. You know, the law makes us aware of our sin, right? So we have a generation that doesn't know the law. They don't even know they, they are guilty of something, probably. But they do know they're under darkness. And we can bring the gospel in more than one way. If you're in Acts, you're going to get to Paul soon. You're not there yet. But when he comes into places that know nothing about God, the God of Israel, what happens first normally? the display of power over the demonic forces. And we need to be aware that's what needs to happen now sometimes in this generation. There's going to need to be a display of power first. Open that door for the message of the cross. They need to see that God's powerful and he's more powerful than the darkness they're living under. And that's, we need the Holy Spirit. You see where I'm getting at? You know, if you have the gospel, that's the power of God for salvation. But Jesus, they had that message, and Jesus told them to wait, right, until they had the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit for the gospel to be effective when we preach it. It's a mistake to, to think just the message is enough, you know. In a sense, anybody can repeat that message. But we need the Spirit's power to go with that message, to make us effective witnesses.
So God's called us to partner in his mission, and we do that with his power. And this is really good news, because that means this is all about God. This is God's work, and we, we are following him in it. And so we just need to ask him. You know, we need to ask God to fill us with the Spirit. It's that simple. All we have to do is ask and walk with him and listen to him. And he's going to show us what to do. He's going to give us the power to do it. And we can do that with joy because we're not living under this guilt like, oh, I'm not doing enough for God. I'm supposed to be doing all this stuff. And I never measure up. And I'm just a failed Christian. And That's not where he wants us. He wants us living in his power, enjoying it. And that comes with the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the driving force of our mission. Do y'all realize, do y'all know that? Like, we don't, we're not going to be effective, like I've been talking about. Great revivals around the world happen when God fills his people with the Spirit. We know that from the Bible. We know that from history. That's what happens. I mean, there's mission work all over the world right now because of what happened in the 1970s, right? God's Spirit was poured out, and it was a boom, an explosion, and people went everywhere. It's God's Spirit that drives mission. In Acts 2, we see that at Pentecost. You know, Acts 4, they were filled with the Spirit in response to prayer and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness, is what it says. Acts 8, the Spirit directed Philip, right? And he went, first Gentile there, saved, that I remember from, you know, the Ethiopian there that it records. Acts 9, Paul was filled with the Spirit after his conversion. In Acts 10, the Spirit fell on the Gentiles after interrupting Peter's sermon. I'm still waiting for that to happen one day. That'd be awesome. If it just stopped right now, that's fine. You know? <laughs> yeah, so that was probably an amazing moment. Acts 13, the Spirit set aside Paul and Barnabas at Antioch during a time of prayer at the church. Do you see how the Spirit, he's directing everything? It's not them. They're following what God's telling them to do. And we should be the same way. This is what we need. If we're going to boldly proclaim the gospel, we have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we, and we need to hear a Spirit directing us to know where, who, and how, right? It's all His Spirit leading us. Every day. Right? We're, we should be asking something. We should be following God. We should be asking Him to give us more revelation. And this Spirit's for all of us. This is, this is the promise of the Father. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Then it says, now he said this about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That living water is the very life of God flowing out of our hearts. And that's the way the Holy Spirit should operate in our lives, where it's just God's life flowing out of us that's reaching other people. It's not this thing we have to work up again. He's given us his spirit, but we should ask for more. And we can ask for more anytime. We should ask him to fill us up, and we're called to walk by the spirit. So what that means, if you're thinking, okay, we know we have a spirit, why do I need more of a spirit? This is confusing. Um, there are ways we can grieve the spirit. And we, we have to think about this as Christians. It's not an automatic thing that we're just going to be walking powerfully by His Spirit, even if we have His Spirit. Even if we're born again, we're His child, we're, you know, we're in the kingdom, your life can still be not lived at its full potential as a Christian. And Paul speaks to this in his letters. We'll read some, some stuff here. And we need to be aware, and I want to call you today to stop grieving the Spirit in your life. You know, this is part of the revival. I think this is part of what I'm seeing in that confession of sin, is God is calling people out of, out of the things that are grieving Him, and out of, out of darkness and into light. So, Paul said we can grieve the Spirit, that's Ephesians 4, through bitterness, unwholesome speech, anger, speaking ill of others. Now, we grieve the Spirit when we do that. He says, And do not grieve the Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, 
along with all malice. So you know when you jump online on, and you start slandering someone who disagrees with you politically, that grieves the spirit, right? It's not a neutral thing just because you're on a computer. That grieves the spirit. There's a lot there. When you gossip about people, you know, any unwholesome speech, when we're angry, all of this grieves the spirit. It also, Paul also said we can quench the spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5. And that's by despising prophecy and participating in evil. You see those two things there. He said, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So we have to be aware that as we give ourselves to certain things, whether it's in private or whatever, it quenches the spirit in this life, in our lives. Also, if we're kind of on the fence about the gift of prophecy and how God speaks through that, and we kind of, yeah, I don't think so, that quenches the spirit. We should be really excited about and open to God's prophetic words. One of the gifts we're supposed to eagerly desire is to prophesy. And, and prophecy is, scripturally speaking, is one of the most common evidences of the presence of God. When he's there, you're going to see people prophesy. That's what happens. So we shouldn't despise prophecy because that's kind of like saying, I despise the Holy Spirit's presence. Do you see how this works? See how that quenches the Spirit? Because that's what happens. Well, I don't want God to talk to me like that. I'm not sure he can. I mean, that's, let's just say, that's kind of ridiculous if you think about that at, at any depth. How could God not speak to us? You know, that's, so, we don't want to quench the Spirit. Also, we can be dulled by the pleasures of this world through foolishness and intoxication. Ephesians 5. Paul said, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We also live in evil days, right? Do you feel that when I say that? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So drunkenness, clearly, is something we should not be participating in. But I think that can extend that principle to a lot of things, right? Certainly to drug use, you know, that would extend to that. Um, so you don't try to get all technical with the Bible and say, well, it doesn't say anything about marijuana. You know, it's the same thing. You're not, it's the same thing. If Paul were living in this day, I can imagine he'd be saying that, you know. Also, anything, I think any kind of worldly pleasure that's sinful, that's intoxicating, we have to watch out. Maybe, maybe it's pornography in your life. Maybe it's something else. You know, anything that's this intoxication, this kind of fleshly indulgence that feels good, we don't want to walk that way. It makes us dull. So in other words, as a believer, you do have the Spirit of God. You can't be born again without the Spirit. But there are ways you can behave and think and speak and live that prevent you from being filled with the Spirit. Do you understand that? And I think that's happening a lot in our time. And God's calling you out of that. It's time to come out. It's time to leave that behind. It's time to put off the, old, the flesh, put off the old man, the old self, and put on the new. Put on all that God has given you by his spirit. Because you can become a very dull and ineffective Christian if you live in disobedience to God and to his spirit. Like a dull knife, right? It's not doing the job it's intended to do. It can't. It can't cut through. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in prayer for our church, and I, I felt like God just showed me his heart for his church, not just living way, but that he's really jealous for us, and he wants our attention in this right now, in this time, in this generation. He wants us to be wholly devoted to him and living by his power. He's calling us, and, and, the, and the window's open. That's the amazing thing. I'm seeing this just, there's a wide open door right now for us. God's, God's moving. And like Hebrews, the author of Hebrews said, I'm sure of better things for you. I really don't believe 
you're called to be dull and ineffective Christians, right? He's calling you to be Christians filled with his power who are effective witnesses for Christ, who are seeing miracles happen, you know, who are just living by his spirit. He's building us into a vibrant, alive, and mature church. You know, he's doing that work, and that window is open. And I, I've just been impressed in my times of prayer that God is doing a new work in our generation. And I, by, I mean, I don't mean like my age group. I mean everyone who's alive right now. God's doing a new work right now in this time. That might be a better way to put it. A fresh work could be another way of saying that. It's happening. And I know I'm not the only one that sees this coming. I mean, we heard that this morning, right? We heard that. I've heard it in other times of prophetic ministry. You know, there's times when God gives special opportunities in history. It's like the wind starts blowing, and it's time to get your sailboat out and catch the breeze if you want to get where you're going. That's where we are. It's like there's this wind starting to blow, and we need to put up the sail and not miss the wind that's blowing right now because there's an opportunity for the gospel to go out, for spiritual growth, for special experiences of his presence. You know, that's, it's starting to happen. And I think that's only going to increase. So let's not miss it. You don't want to be the one that missed it. You know, staying in the back row, and I'm not trying to pick on you in the back row, sorry. You know, not, not, I used to sit in the back row all the time. But yeah, <laughs> when we had little kids and needed to get out. But, uh, start, you know, it's, you don't want to miss this time. You don't want to miss the chance to be a part of what God's going to do. One of those times right now, it's starting. So I do want to have a time of prayer here in just a second. I think the team's going to come up. and I want to invite anybody up, and maybe everybody, I don't know, whoever wants to come up and get prayer for being filled with the Spirit. But I wanted to read through a few things that you could come get prayer for in case you're like, well, I think I'm filled with the Spirit. I'd say just go ahead and get prayer again, even if you think you are. But um, if you don't know the Lord, of course, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never responded to him, please come up too. Someone can walk you through that. Um, being baptized in the Spirit, if you just want prayer for being a bold witness, if you're struggling with sin, you know, I mentioned confession, I, I want you to come up, you know, you don't have to talk to me about it. I understand you don't know me, but you do have your elders and pastors here. And uh, talk to them. Share what's going on. Open up about it. If you're under dark thoughts or anxiety, depression, you know, I have a lot of faith God can set you free from that. Demonic power, if you sense that's a reality in your life, you know, I also want you to come get prayer for that. Anything else, any reason you have to come up, I just want to encourage you but especially to be filled with the Spirit. And that's my focus. We need God's power. So you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's the promise. So let's ask for that power. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And I guess, Ben, can you want to direct them through the prayer time? Yeah. Well, Lord, we give this time to you here. We thank you that you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, you reign over every authority, over every power of darkness. Lord, you reign over us, your church. And Lord, we ask you to move in power by your spirit this morning, that you would fill us. Lord, that you would wake us up to all that you're doing, that you would break every stronghold of thought, Lord, of, of demonic power, whatever it might be. Lord, we want to see you move in this generation. We want to be a part of what you're doing. And we ask you to, to move in power now. In Jesus' name, amen.